<laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. So we'll get started. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Somi Malani. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I'm board um, certified in naturopathic oncology. So naturopathic medicine is probably a new term to some folks. So we'll go through it. Um, I specialize in the field of integrative oncology. Um, and I'll go into my background a little bit more, but thank you to Cancer Support Community and St. Elizabeth for allowing me to be here and to talk. It's a beautiful uh, facility and I'm really happy that we all made it here safely. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so a little bit about my background. Um, I did my undergrad in New York. Um, I went to Bastyr University, which is a naturopathic medical school on the West Coast. So it's in Seattle, Washington. Moved out there when I was 19 or 20 and um, have been there ever since. I just relocated back to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I was out there for medical school. Uh, Bass year is a four-year medical degree, so it's equivalent um, and comparable to a DO and an MD program. But during our medical school training, we get, in, we get uh, classes in nutrition and botanical medicine, pharmaceuticals, um, as well as um, you know exercise prescriptions, IV therapies. So we get, really get to learn kind of the spectrum of medicine. After um, last year, I did a three-year residency at a clinic um, and research institute called Ames Institute in Seattle, Washington. That was an integrative oncology residency. So I was actually with MDs and NDs and PhDs um, that I got to rotate with. That was wonderful. I was also affiliated with Evergreen Hospital out there. So I got to do all of my hospital rotations at Evergreen, which is kind of known, unfortunately, as the ground zero for COVID out there. <laughs> That was where the first case was in 2020. Um, after residency, I did a postdoctoral research fellowship. And so I currently work on clinical trial um, nationwide um, to figure out whether integrative oncology works for cancer patients. So that's my main focus. I teach, I write, I do all of it um, because I love it. So today's agenda is to learn for those who are new to naturopathic medicine, what is naturopathic medicine? What does integrative oncology mean? Um, and if you've recently been diagnosed, can how do you utilize it? What What is it? What are the treatments? Um, so we'll get into all of that. Um, I briefly touched on this, but I just want to reiterate. So a naturopathic doctor is on the West Coast and the East Coast. A naturopathic doctor, also known as an ND, um, are like Starbucks. They're on every corner. Everyone has a naturopathic doctor. Um, and then you come to the middle of the country. <laughs> and there is a few, and I'm one of them. And so I'm very excited, honestly, to return to this part of the country and bring something that I've seen works so well for so many patients um, to, you know, bring it a increase awareness. Um, so we do go through four years of medical school. We go through residencies. We go through our step one, step two. We do it all. And it's um, exhausting and exhilarating all at the same time. All right. Um, what is integrative oncology? And I will give you a little bit of a um, intro into how I found myself here. So I was actually studying graphic design political science um, in college. I was not planning to be a doctor, um, but cancer kept coming up in my life. So my mom was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer when I was six years old. My father, who was a medical doctor, was diagnosed with stage four gastric cancer when I was 19. So two parents, two out of two, both diagnosed. And when my father was diagnosed, um, I was in the middle of college. I was in that, you know, what do I do with my life phase? And I was really just um, amazed and moved by some of the doctors that I met during his journey and some of the integrated medicine that I learned about. So I said, I need to dedicate my life to this and it all worked out. So here I am. So what is integrative oncology? Integrative oncology is a evidence informed way to complement cancer care. So we are talking about lifestyle, diet, exercise, nutrition, botanical medicine, IV therapy, adjunctively to conventional cancer care. So this is not in replacement of chemo surgery radiation. This is adjunct and make it work better. So my goals as an integrative oncologist are to increase my patient's quality of life, decrease their side effects, and increase the effectiveness of their primary cancer treatment. And this is where kind of my personal story really comes in. Um, I've watched my parents go through chemo, go through radiation, go through surgery, and I've been the one on the other side to, to say like, you're exhausted, what can we do? Or, you know, you have pain or you see all the side effects and how that inhibited their quality of life and their home life, right? It really affects, you know, more than just um, the person who is, is diagnosed. So that's why I really uh, think this medicine is just able to affect 
more than just the patient. It's able to affect their whole bu bubble, their whole circle, their whole home, um, because they can get through treatment feeling much better, much better quality of life, and not having any side effects. Um, Integrative oncologists like myself, we work in tandem with our oncology team. So I am not, again, here to replace anyone. I'm here to make whatever you're currently doing work better. Um, in Seattle, where I trained, uh, we were integrated into the hospital system. So I had Epic access, the integrative oncologist would prefer me, uh, or sorry, the medical oncologist would prefer the radiation oncologist. And the beautiful thing about it is there was this trust. You know, the medical oncologist knew that they knew the, the chemo inside and out. They knew the surgery recommendations. They knew the radiation. But when their patients were coming in and asking them, hey, can I take this supplement or can I take this herb? They were like, listen, I don't know this, but I know someone who is trained and can help you do this alongside your chemo. So there's this really kind of beauty that I've seen on the East Coast that I would love to bring here of, of the integration. Uh, so who can it help? There's kind of four different categories of patients that I work with. Um, and I have a private practice right now and I still see patients on Se uh, in Seattle, Washington via telemedicine. So my patient panel is based uh, is made up of either high risk patients, patients who have never been diagnosed with cancer before, but maybe have a strong family history or have a genetic mutation that increases their risk of developing cancer, who are wanting to be proactive in um, preventing the diagnosis. Um, the second set of patients that I work with are those that are in active treatment. So patients that are under, under actively undergoing chemo, surgery, radiation, who want support. And then um, the last set are my cancer survivors who have made it through the trenches um, and are on the other side and either worried about relapse or unfortunately their body may have been a little bit, um, you know, thrown off by chemo or surgery or radiation and they want to restore their, their health. Um, for a lot of cancer patients, it's a wake up call, this diagnosis, right? And it's an opportunity for them to really take their health into consideration, prioritize their health in a way that they never have before. And um, for a lot of them, cancer builds a body awareness, right? You kind of, once you have that diagnosis, you're constantly checking in with yourself. This, my head's hurting, my knees hurt, you know, what's going on? And that body awareness that you have can help you get your body back to better than it was before you were diagnosed, you know? Because you're aware, okay, you know, when I eat this, now my stomach hurts, so what should I do? Or when I drink this, my, I get a headache, so what should I do? I want to feel good. Um, so that, that's, those are all the patients. Uh, this, is a, um, this is a kind of diagram that is used very often in the cancer community. It's called the cancer continuum. So it basically um, outlines the entire cancer journey. And this is really what I want integrative oncology to be, to be focusing on. Because I think if you see here, like the diagnosis and treatment, that's where most people think of cancer, right? They don't, they don't think of cancer until they've been labeled with that cancer term. You've officially been diagnosed, right? But cancer starts way before that, right? Every, everybody has cells. Any cell can become a cancer cell, right? It takes a genetic mutation. Um, and so the kind of environmental factors, the genetic factors, the different um, infectious agents that we're exposed to, our different health behaviors are all kind of part of this bigger cancer journey, right? Um, are they leading us maybe towards cancer promoting behaviors or are they leading us away from it? Obviously there's a lot of prevention that we can do just through um, you know, talking about with patients, the risk factors that we know develop um, cancers, things like smoking or vaccines, like HPV vaccines, things like that. We know that can help reduce the risk. Um, we, I work a lot about education uh, with screening exams and making sure our patients are staying on top of that. This is something that we saw during COVID go down to the tube. I think everyone saw this. Um, it just because patients weren't going to the doctor, right, during COVID. And so we're playing catch up now with every screen. Yeah. So, um, but cancer is much, the, the point I want to make here is cancer is a much bigger journey than just the diagnosis and the treatment. Okay, so how can it help? Ugh, this is like maybe 10 of the gazillion ways to help, but I'll go through some of them. So um, for my patients who are going through surgery, we can implement some strategies to help them recover from surgery better. Um, a big thing that I make sure that I do with my patients is get their bowels going as soon as they're out of surgery so that they're not feeling backed up, that they're, you know, they're getting that function and so they can get out of the hospital sooner, right? We don't want our patients in the hospital if they don't have to be. Um, there's, you know, a whole economic and political argument that you can make there as well, but uh, we want to get our patients out, we want to get them recovered, we want to get them home, their own bed, their own house. Um, and so that's definitely something that we can do. Um, comorbidities. So patients who have pre-existing maybe diabetes or anxiety, depression, or some sort of autoimmune condition, 
um, sometimes get overlooked when they've been diagnosed with cancer. So obviously cancer takes precedent when it comes to what, what are you working on? But we still have these maybe inflammatory pathways or you know autoimmune pathways that we still need to be thinking about while we're treating the cancer. And integrative oncologists can definitely do that because we're really good at zooming out and looking at the picture. We can manage chemotherapy related side effects with safe medicines. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet that is not safe and that scares me. So safe, effective, evidence-based medicine. Um, a lot of cancer patients complain of, of sleep issues, insomnia. They explain uh, complain of a lot of fatigue. They're evidence-based way to help, help there. Making sure they're getting adequate nutrition. This is really um, important when uh, patients are undergoing chemotherapy that's making them feel sick and they don't want to eat or their taste buds have changed or their everything tastes like metallic or, you know, um, helping them make sure they're getting creative ways to, to get nutrition in. Um, supplements, uh, definitely a lot of education here. Um, again, I think it's important for patients to know what works as well as knowing what doesn't work. And I think there's a lot of information I'm going to call TikTok out. TikTok and Instagram and a lot of these social media sites that are saying like, oh, if you just take this herb or if you just take this tea. And sometimes that can interact with your chemotherapy in a way that we don't want it to. Um, so education about that. And um, the other aspect and one that is really um, important to me is making sure that the existential distress and kind of that there's this, you know, death is looming, right? Death is now a word that's very close to a lot of cancer patients. And that existential distress that comes with it needs to be addressed needs to be talked about. You know, there's this elephant in the room. Let's let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? It's not scary. So what one the one thing we have in common is that we're all gonna die. Um, so let's talk about it. Okay, so some treatments. And um before I get into treatments, I would just want to also say the the one comment that I get a lot from my patients too is so an average uh, medical oncology visit is like 15 to 23 minutes, right? You don't get a whole lot of time for medical oncologists to go through treatments and, um, you know, go through what the side effects are. Um, sometimes that's left to the handout that they give you on the way out where it's like self-education. A lot of times what I'm doing is I tell my patients, um, when you're given the cancer diagnosis, you're kind of put on this cancer conveyor belt, right? And it's like appointment to appointment to appointment, image to blood draw to, you know, infusion. And my goal is to use our appointments as an opportunity to step off the, the conveyor belt, zoom out, look around, and make sure that we get back on the best way, right? So let's take a, let's take a moment to figure out, okay, what is chemo actually doing to my body? What is radiation doing to my body? What is surgery going to do to my cancer? Um, and I think it's important to know that because when patients know what they're doing, not when patients, but when humans know what they're doing, they're likely to be more compliant. I'm sure everyone's dealt with like a kid that's like, why, mom, why do I have to eat this? vegetables are good for you, but why, you know, like going through that conversation, we're all, we all have that, that we don't grow out of that, right? Like, why, why do I have to do this? And I think taking the time to answer those questions increases compliance, which can increase outcomes. So carcinogenesis, which is carcinogenesis, which is the um, kind of formation of cancer growth is multifactorial. There's so many different um, components to how cancer can actually form or a tumor can form. Um, there's environmental factors. There's obviously factors from the immune system, metabolic, lifestyle, genetic, epigenetic, which is kind of a growing field right now, and psychospiritual. So integrative oncologists really try to look at all of these. Um, and we're doing that alongside the medical oncologists really looking at how do we get rid of the tumor, right? How do we, how do we get rid of this cancer? So we're kind of on the periphery while they're looking at the main tumor burden. So treatments, um, nutrition, phytomedicines, which is a fancy word for basically botanical medicine, um, exercise prescriptions, acupuncture, we have amazing acupuncture in the room as well, and uh, diet, lifestyle, mind-body medicine, some IV therapy can be really helpful in certain situations, and then advanced lab testing. Um, so there are some tests that integrative oncologists like to integrate with medical oncologists to see, okay, can we track treatment response or can we track surveillance, things like that. Um, what integrative oncology is not, and this is, um, unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of patients, when they come to integrative oncologists like myself, they think, okay, I'm going to go to Dr. Milani. She's going to tell me not to do chemo, not to do surgery, not to do radiation, and she's going to tell me that I can cure this with juice. That is the exact opposite of what I do. Um, so again, evidence from an evidence-based perspective, Integrative oncology is really about combining the best of both worlds, combining the best of conventional medicine, combining the best of naturopathic, functional, integrative medicine. 
all those words kind of the same. So, um, but it is not about supplementing or um, replacing your primary cancer treatment. Um, I particularly, I put this slide up there kind of for a reason. Um, I really like the concept of harm reduction and talking about treatments that don't work to reduce harm. So if my patient comes in and, you know, maybe they haven't consulted with me before, but they're like, hey, Dr. Molly, I just got a breast cancer diagnosis and I went on a juice fast. And um, tell me what supplements to take. I spend my entire visit explaining why a juice fast is not going to help, right? Um, sure, maybe if your stomach is, you know, in a really tight spot and you have inflammation in your, you know, GI lining and you can only tolerate juice, then yeah, maybe let's talk about supplementing your food diet with some juices. But going on a juice cleanse or taking buckets of supplements, um, doing something like uh, an elimination diet where you're going to be nutritionally depleted is not what we're here to do. We're here to really improve your outcomes with evidence-based medicine. So um, I think the harm reduction component is really important. And this is also where I find medical oncologists really appreciate integrative oncologists. Um, you know, medonks get these questions all the time. Their patients will come in and say, well, can I take this? Or, you know, can I drink this tea? And um, they can always punt that question to us that we can educate them. Hey, that tea not might not work, but here is a tea that is evidence based that can help your ovarian cancer. So, um, and this is exactly what I just said in a different way. So, approximately um, eighty five, and this was this was as of twenty eighteen. So the data might be a little bit higher, but eighty five percent of cancer patients are using integrative or functional medicine alongside their diagnosis. Not all eighty five percent of those cancer patients are telling their medical oncologist that they're doing it, and that's another thing. Um, I'm really um, you can tell I like to talk, I like to communicate, and I'm a big communicator with my primary um, cancer team. So well, as soon as I see a patient, I'm usually faxing my notes to the medical oncologist, to the um, radiation oncologist, whoever it is, so that they know what I'm doing and that they know that I know what they're doing and I'm thinking about it, right? So let's do integrative oncology. All right, so the biomedicine, so this is where I feel like a lot of people get excited. Um, so green tea extract, uh, resveratrol, curcumin, quercetin, these are all things that probably people have heard about. Um, there's kind of this like big five in the supplement world when it comes, or the phytomedicine or supplement world when it comes to cancer. Um, green tea extract, resveratrol, curcumin, quercetin have some of the best research behind them. Uh, there's different cancers where these components work better. The other thing that's really important is dosage. So I find because the supplement industry is not regulated, basically any company can put out a, a supplement and um, they don't have to go through standardized testing. They don't have to go through clinical trials. And so you could be taking, curcumin is my favorite example, you could be taking your curcumin that you bought at Walgreens or bought it at Kroger and thinking that you're getting some benefit from it. But the research shows that curcumin you need to be taking anywhere between one to 3,000 3, milligrams, which is one to three grams. And if you look at the back of your curcumin bottle, anyone that has curcumin at their home right now, go home and look at it, you'll probably see that there's maybe 25 to 100 milligrams. So therapeutic doses is 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams. What's on the stores in most products, 25 to 100 milligrams. And honestly, 100 milligrams is like, that's a good quality product. You know, that's like, that's, you don't find that often. It's usually 25 to 50. Um, the other question I get about curcumin that I'll just um, also insert here is uh, a lot of patients say curcumin comes from turmeric. So turmeric is the, the root that will stain anything yellow. It's used a lot of Indian cooking. It's used in things like curry. Um, but curcumin is a medical constituent from turmeric. And a lot of people ask me, can I just add turmeric powder to my food? You know, I add it to my dishes. Is that enough? Well, to get a therapeutic dose or a clinically effective dose of curcumin, you need 20 tablespoons. It's a lot. My family, my parents are both from India, so we use curcumin and, or we use turmeric in everything, and even I like would could not get that down. <laughs> At max, I actually I asked my mom. I said, "Mom, on average, how much do you use in your cooking?" Um, and she didn't know the context of the question. She was like, "Oh, maybe like a, a teaspoon at max." Like she's like, "It's a pinch. It's for color." So I find that if we are going to use curcumin, let's use the right product, the right dose. Same with first and research all of these. Um, and I just put this up there to kind of show. So these medicines, um, curcumin, green tea, shark, sulfur, thing that's found in broccoli, um, broccoli sprouts, resveratrol, and um, something that's found in soy is being um, looked at from this angle of, can it actually target cancer stem cells? And a lot of people, the kind of clinical oncology world right now is wondering whether can cancer stem cells could be um, at play when it comes to recurrence. 
because chemotherapy can eradicate cancer cells, but do we really know if chemotherapy can affect cancer stem cells? So maybe coming in from a surveillance standpoint, once you're done with treatment, using some of these medicines could potentially have therapeutic benefit to prevent recurrence. Very much still research is underway, but that's why I brought it up. Acupuncture. So um, I also uh, I will also want to point out that acupuncture is included in this PowerPoint presentation and in this integrative oncology presentation because integrative oncology really is this umbrella for all of these different modalities. So I think sometimes um, patients can feel really parsed out or feel like they're being siloed out when it comes to doing, you know, um, adjunct treatment for their cancer. So they're either sent to a nutritionist or sent to an acupuncturist or sent to a massage therapist, and they don't feel like there's crosstalk. So integrative oncology is that crosstalk. We're the ones that are bridging everything and we're coordinating the care between the conventional oncologist, the acupuncturist, the massage therapist, you know, all of that. We're about trying to make it all work for the patient to improve outcomes and improve their quality of life. Because it's honestly really exhausting to be a patient. If anyone is sat in that seat, it's exhausting coordinating your care. It's exhausting calling doctors. It's exhausting trying to call medical records offices and say, hey, I just started with a new, you know, um, acupuncturist, can you fax my records? Over? Like all of that stuff is stressful to the patient and is not therapeutic for their healing. So we really want to make their lives easier. Acupuncture is one of my favorite modalities when it comes to integrated medicine. Um, there is so much research showing how acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine um, can improve quality of life in cancer patients. Um, in China, and maybe you can speak to this as well, but in China, um, acupuncture is used in the cancer hospitals just as a as a treatment, and that's kind of ingrained in their system. Um, they find it, there's a lot of safety behind it. There's a lot of efficacy. Um, I use it a lot when it comes to insomnia in my patients, uh, joint pain specifically related to aromatase inhibitors. So a lot of breast cancer patients are put on medication like aromatase inhibitors to prevent recurrence. And the joint pain that comes up can be really affected by acupuncture. Um, nausea from chemotherapy, really helpful, and neuropathy. So um, that tingling that you feel, the numbness and tingling that you feel in your hands and toes after treatment, acupuncture can be really helpful. The hospital that I used to work in in Seattle used to have acupuncturists that would give treatments right before chemotherapy. So patients would go for acupuncture, they'd go for chemo. Um, and this is just, this is the aromatase inhibitor um, trial action. Diet and lifestyle. So these are the more um, nuanced uh, conversations that we have with patients. Diet and lifestyle are very specific to how a patient is already living, right? So if I'm telling, um, you know, a, a mom who maybe has two kids and is a single mom and is working a couple jobs who's also been diagnosed to eat organic, it's not really therapeutic, is it, right? Asking them to put a huge financial burden on them. So really kind of figuring out, okay, what is this, what is this person's life currently like and how can we amplify it in any ways? Um, you know, as much as uh, I can, I do educate all my patients about blood sugar and managing um, elevations in their blood sugar. My favorite conversation I have with patients is breakfast and what it means. Breakfast means to break the fast after, you know, having a fast overnight. Um, but many of us in this country and culture tend to eat right until we go to bed. And then as soon as we wake up, we have a snack in our mouth. And usually what we have in our mouth in the morning is very sugary. So we live in a world where um, processed foods and, and sugar is like the breakfast item here. Um, you know, whether it's cereals or bagels or muffins, and that's a huge spike in your blood sugar first thing in the morning, which is going to make you feel like crap. You're going to have a lot of fatigue, and it's also not great for um, inflammation and kind of disease, manage, man, disease management. Uh, I talk about med Mediterranean diet a lot, decreasing packaged and processed foods, so those are just some examples, but a key thing that I wrote here as well is um, it is important to remember the side effects that the patient's going through, right? So that the example that I gave you of a single mom who has a couple jobs and is going through breast cancer treatment, um, her recommendations during treatment are going to be very different than her, treat than her recommendations after treatment and during her survivorship period, right? Thinking about what does she need in the moment if she's having any side effects versus what does she need from a sustainability standpoint to decrease her overall um, kind of an inflammatory burden. Um, lifestyle. So stress management, mindfulness uh, are all really, really crucial. Again, I'm a huge proponent of connecting patients with either counselors or spiritual you know, counselors or um, psychotherapists or groups. Because again, this cancer diagnosis is like, it's just like scary term in our culture, right? It's like cancer is the C word. Don't talk about it. We don't know what to do. You know, 
Um, and patients feel very, very isolated with that. And so connecting them with like-minded people, maybe you're undergoing the same thing, can be regulated to their nervous system, which is very important. Cool. Um, I also love death cafes. Um, so connecting patients with uh, groups who are talking about death, you don't have to be terminal or actively dying um, to join one of these death cafes, but they're very popular now online for virtual. This is something that developed um, in, I believe, uh, Europe after World War II. People would get together, drink a nice, you know, scotch or coffee, and talk about death because they were seeing it so much in the, in the war, right? Um, but we all, again, have that one thing in common. Can we talk about it? Movement is really important. Movement really helps your immune system during treatment and after treatment. So increasing natural killer cell functions, which are the um, type of white blood cell that we want to increase during cancer treatment. Um, so talking, having all of these evidence-informed conversations. IV therapy is another one that can be helpful. So this is helpful sometimes during treatment when patients are feeling really depleted. Um, there is some research on IV vitamin C. IV vitamin C is a question I get a lot from patients. Um, so IV vitamin C, there is some uh, preliminary research showing that it can reduce toxicity um, related to chemotherapy in ovarian cancer patients. Pretty small trial, but there was good results. I would love to see that trial be replicated. At Saint Elizabeth. <laughs> um, but there is definitely some data to show that it could be helpful to decrease um, side effects. Also, uh, it improves quality of life in patients who are advanced stage and terminal. So again, also uh, this, there are a lot of IV clinics that I see popping up um, and they don't necessarily know how to treat cancer patients. Something like IV vitamin C, you need to run some, you need to run some lab, lab work before you do it to make sure your kidney functions are working well. You don't have something called a G6 deficiency um, because that, if you have something like that, vitamin C can be really uh, harmful to your body. So working with someone who's informed and can help you figure out if that's the right treatment for you. There's also um, IV mistletoe is becoming a popular kind of term right now. John Hopkins is currently studying it and there was just a phase one trial showing safety and they're doing some more uh, research on it right now. But uh, if you're interested in these, then let's talk to someone who knows how to do it for you. Don't go rogue on us. That's what I ask my patients. Please don't go rogue on me. Um, this is a trial um, that was done in 2014 on high dose vitamin C with um, ovarian cancer. And I'll just point, point this out. And um, I'm particularly excited about uh, this slide, and I won't spend too much time on it. But um, there's an amazing doctor at St. Elizabeth, Dr. Laura, as we're going to feed in later today, who is um, really kind of a leader in precision oncology. So. Precision oncology is something integrative oncologists are also trained in. Um, what precision oncology means is for oncology has, for you know a very long time now has been done, um, find the tumor, where the location is, and then match the chemo to the tumor. Now we can do a blood test or genetic testing on tissue sample and look at the genetic mutations of the tumor itself, cancer cell, called circulating tumor DNA. We can look for the DNA of the tumors figure out if there's a genetic mutation that we could target with a different drug, and then use that. Um, so this is something that I think Stanley's already a leader in, in, in getting to be a leader and a voice. Um, but this is definitely something that I like to use for patients. The other reason why is there are certain botanical medicines, but phytomedicines that are specific to genetic mutations. So if I know the genetic mutations of my cancer's tumor, or uh, sorry, of my patient's tumor, um, can I prescribe maybe quercetin? if it's specific to that genetic mutation or curcumin. And then we can come up with more targeted supplements so that our patients aren't swallowing gazillion supplements because that's the last thing I want any patients to do. Um, okay, so a real world example and what time are we? Okay, so I'm gonna do this quickly so that we have time for questions as well. But um, this was a patient uh, who I saw a few years ago. So she was a, let me pause there. Any questions before I get into a real life example? No? Okay, so this is a 29-year-old um, female that I saw who was diagnosed with a brain tumor known as anaplastic astrocytoma. So she first presented to the ER. She was having world word recall um, difficulty. She was having fatigue and joint pain. They ended up doing a brain MRI on her. Um, she advocated it. She advocated it for it. She was really kind of vocal, like, "Hey, if something has been right. It has been right for a while." So they did a um, MRI and they found a tumor in her right parietal lobe, so in her brain. She kind of immediately underwent surgery and was diagnosed with a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. Um, for those who don't under, know what an ast anaplastic astrocytoma is, it's a one of the most common brain tumors. Um, and it is just a notch below the most aggressive 
form of brain cancer, which is known as glioblastoma multiforme, GBM. Um, and so it is a pretty aggressive cancer for a 29 year old with a really long life ahead of her, right? And she was currently at school, she's at the University of Washington, um, and she had her family's all, all on the East Coast, so she was kind of on her own. So she came to us right after her surgery. Uh, this is just a little picture of what that is. Um, she came to us right after surgery before she was ready to start chemotherapy radiation. She's very anxious. She's trying to figure out what can I do. Um, and at that time, she was experiencing a lot of fatigue. And this was kind of unrelated to the surgery because she'd been having fatigue for quite some time. Her appetite was low. She was having pain in her head. Um, she described this kind of like headache, pain, and pressure behind her eyes. And she was also experiencing double vision. Double vision is common after a surgery like that, um, but she was really kind of trying to figure out if there's anything that she could do. So while she was recovering from surgery, we waited the, the period for a, a, uh, to allow her body to heal, but we added a high dose curcumin, so at 2,000 milligrams or two grams, as an anti-inflammatory, and we added something called, called boswellia. Um, boswellia is also known as frankincense, which many people know. Yeah, so frankincense at also a high dose, so 40. 200 milligrams. And I put those dosages on there just to show that the dosages that we're using in a therapeutic fashion are very different what you find in the supplement market. Um, but both of these have been shown to decrease cerebral edema. So basically swelling of the brain. So we wanted to decrease that to help recover from surgery. And she was on um, a steroid known as dexamethasone, which can cause um, you to feel kind of, it's kind of like an upper. So you have difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. She was having um, issues with sleep and she was if anyone has ever spent a couple nights not sleeping, you feel pretty cra crappy. So she was like, definitely, I need to do something for my sleep. So our kind of roundabout way was, okay, if we can decrease um, the swelling, then maybe you don't need as much as a steroid, and then you can start to sleep. So worked alongside her medical oncologist, ran every single treatment recommendation by him, um, showed him all of the research. He's an awesome med -onc in Seattle, Washington. And under the care of her medical oncologist, sorry, Two weeks after starting the Bosnia, she her double vision had improved 60%. So there was a huge improvement there. And under the care of a medical oncologist, we cleared it with him and he reduced her dex 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 dexamethasone dose and she was able to start sleeping again. So integrative, safe, evidence-based. Um, this is actually a trial from 2011, um, randomized placebo-controlled double-blind pilot trial that was done on Bosnia, frankincense, for cerebral edema in patients that had um, just had radiation. So in our situation, we didn't, she hadn't had radiation yet, but we ran this by our medical oncologist. We had collaborative conversation, um, interdisciplinary conversation. And he was like, let's, let's try on this. We're going to do that. Keep everything the same. Then we'll see if she starts to have a reduction in symptoms. We'll take the sex up. So go. So really nice kind of, um, collaboration. She then received proton um, radiation therapy for six weeks. We kept our treatments um, as recommended. We did Boswellia and um, we did curcumin. Curcumin acts as a radio sensitizer also. So it makes the tissues a little bit more sensitive to the radiation so that the radiation works better. So we kept the, radi we kept the curcumin for that reason. Um, both of them were cleared by her radiation oncologist. We sent her to acupuncture to help with her fatigue, which really, really helped. Um, we discussed the importance of eating a whole foods um, kind of diet. So she was a college student, or actually, sorry, she was getting her master's. Um, at this time, yeah, she was getting her master's in fine arts at this time. So she was in school and, um, you know, she did, was living on a student budget, didn't have a whole lot to go to Whole Foods every day and kind of get all those fancy meals. So we just talked about, okay, what can, what are you currently doing that we could start to modify? Um, what it, that was for her was decreasing the processed food. So simple recommendation of let's cut out the, um, anything that comes from a box or package for you. Simple recommendation. We uh, made sure she was drinking enough water. And we asked her to get 15 to 20 minutes of gentle walking and stretching it. Um, I love, again, integrating the recommendations into my patient's life. So her roommate was on one of her calls and I said, hey, roommate, can you make sure that you guys do at least 15 to 20 minute walks every single day? And it ended up becoming like a ritual that they just started doing every morning. It also, this was actually right around the beginning of COVID. So they kind of got locked in together as well. So I think it was also maybe a good friendship bonding exercise. <laughs> Um, I also ended up referring her to a psychotherapist who specializes in the field of psycho-oncology. So um, kind of the, the existential distress that we've talked about, um, that comes up and there's a whole field now called psycho-oncology that can help with, um, address it. So referred her to a psychotherapist. And then um, in 20 or a couple months later, 
Yeah, 20, okay. Um, she had uh, post-operative changes. The, um, the reception um, was successful and she started um, temozolomide or temazar, uh, which is a common uh, chemotherapy used in, um, in brain cancer. We continue the curcumin and bosmelia. We, uh, we made sure that we check drug herb interactions. That's a huge thing that I stress to all of the docs that I work with. Uh, we want to make sure that there's no interaction between what we're doing and what you're doing. And then she had some constipation from the temazar. So we actually added some magnesium to help with that. And she didn't have constipation after that. She has actually been clear since October of 2020. So I just saw her last week and her MRI is considered to be stable. There's no progression there. Um, there's definitely, she still has a lot of anxiety, anxiety related to her diagnosis. Every time she goes in for her scan, it's this like very, very, very scary day. Um, I am really fortunate to work with a great team. We sent her notes on the day of her scans. And so she has like a little kind of, hey, take a deep breath kind of reminder. Um, and that's all done from the team that I work with. So I can't take credit for that. But, um, you know, it's it, it's also like, let's continue to address that anxiety. Let's not ask you to suppress it or repress it because it's it's a real thing. Um, she also did just graduate from MFA last week. This is all of the evidence-based uh, recommendations. So you can see here kind of curcumin, these is chemo sensitizer and radio sensitizer. Um, curcumin is an anti-inflammatory agent. Bosnilia works without cerebral edema. So all of this that we're doing, acupuncture, cancer-related fatigue, all that we're doing is has been shown in the data to work. So I would love to see this be standard. Um, that is all I have for you guys today. Um, what questions do you have? Yeah. 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 Great question. So I, I have 